Okay, shall we begin then? So, um, as Max says, welcome to everyone around the world, wherever you happen to be. I know we normally have quite a large international audience. Um, so, um, I'll just, I've got a few introductory slides, um, and then um, the main um, topic of the evening is um, capturing the visible universe in a single image by um, Charles and, and, and Max. Um, which sounds like quite a challenge to me, that one. So looking forward to hearing um, how they managed to do that. Um, yeah, just a few a few items from me. So um, for um, ASC members, we are still looking for volunteers, I think, to help at the Royal Observatory at Edinburgh on the 23rd and 24th September. They have their doors open days, and we always do it, and it's always good fun. You get um, a meal paid for as well each day, and coffee and so on. Um, if you can do either or both of those days, see Peter Black or Alan Ellis or email them or something. And this Sunday, Collective Gallery, who took over Carlton Hill Observatory, are having their gala day to celebrate five years of being up there. And we have a few members already showing people around the Cook Telescope. Um, you are able to go up there and visit it yourself if you've never seen the Cook Telescope. It's an amazing instrument. And it may be you want to help as well. So um, Will and Co will be grateful for some help up there as well. So get in touch as well. <clears throat> um, the, the monetary side, the dirty side, um, subscriptions will be due on the 1st of October. We are doing a very slight increase, 30 to 32 pounds and 15 to 16 pounds. Um, our costs have increased a lot more than that, but we're still keeping it as, as low as we can. And it's still really great value for money if you count out work out how much it costs per day to be a member of this society. And there are many ways you can stay in touch with us uh, through our website, which has everything that we do going on there, lots of interesting articles, um, Facebook, um, Twitter, or X as it's called now, I need to update that. Um, we also have masses and masses of amazing um, videos from the last three or four years of talks from amazing people all around the world. And this one will be um, on there afterwards as well. I'm looking forward to seeing that. We also have a Flickr group for our imaging um, group. And there are some amazing images taken from the center of Edinburgh, believe it or not, some of these, many of these. And we also have uh, another Flickr group, which I haven't linked on here, which is for our new remote facility in, in Spain, but more about that another time, not tonight. These are the talks that are coming up over the next couple of months. So the next one is on the 6th of October. Um, that is a hybrid meeting. So we will be physically present in Edinburgh at the Augustine United Church. We'll be on Zoom for ASC members who can't make it there and YouTube for um, any visitors who want to join us. And that's about fear and loathing in the heavens, the 1910 return of Halley's Comet. Um, we always have our monthly imaging from observing group and that is for members only. And that's the Wednesday after the first meeting of the month. On the 20th of October, an online meeting, we have Mary McIntyre telling us about history of women in astronomy. And that's um, part one of two. She'll be giving us a second part of that in February next year. On the 3rd of November, which is a, a change to the original talk, which we had to reschedule, we have Dr. Hernandez Santisteban about supermassive black holes. That will be a hybrid meeting again. On the 17th of November, this is a talk that was rescheduled and it's a traveler's guide to the stars uh, from Les Johnson. And on the 1st of December, another hybrid meeting, the search for life by someone who's done it, um, Richard Shaw. So um, feel free to join us. Visitors are always welcome. It's always live on YouTube and um, see you then. But that's it um, from me. So it's over to the, the main topic from the for the evening so i'm going to hand over uh, to max and charles and stop sharing so if you want to take over the sharing be great absolutely great thank you guys so much for having us it's it's great to be here uh so yes yeah, so max and i are going to talk to you about capturing the visible universe in a single image uh so we'll uh we're going to walk through a little bit of detail on how we did this so there's going to be some image processing stuff in here but we'll also use the image to explore uh, what's out there in the sky a little bit as well. So first, uh, let's uh, do some introductions. So um, I'm Charlie Bracken. I am, as you can see, I'm a few time zones uh, west of you guys. So it's uh, it's still still sunny here right now in the afternoon in Pennsylvania. So I, I live just north of Philadelphia. 
Uh, I've written several books on astrophotography. Uh, my most popular one is probably the Deep Sky Imaging Primer, um, uh, basically how-to guides for how to do this. Uh, Max? Yep. Hello. Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, wonderful to have this opportunity to talk to you all. So thanks so much. Um, uh, I, I have a background in originally science broadcasting. I worked on uh, Tomorrow's World, which some of you might possibly remember, and Horizon, the science series. And I then got involved in the BBC's um, interactive work, very early interactive work, uh, and I led a collaboration with Apple in America and got involved in producing apps. So that's been my main background really during my career. Uh, but five years ago, I was fortunate enough to be able to leave London and move to Holy Island, uh, just down the coast in Northumberland. And that's where I live now. Um, and I uh, have a, an observatory there. And uh, I had the great good fortune to buy a copy of Charlie's book, The Deep Sky Primer, and uh, learn really um, how to climb the learning curve of taking photographs of objects in the sky. And uh, that's really um, uh, all I'll say for now. Ch Ch Charlie will tell you more about the project that we've been working on together for three or four years now. Yeah, happy to. All right, so Max and I collaborated on this book. So we are co-authors on The Visible Universe. So this is kind of uh, the, the, the reason that we've, we've been working together for, the, for a couple of years. This was a project that started before the pandemic, became a fairly intense project during the pandemic, and we were able to release it kind of as we were coming out of the pandemic. Um, so our goal here is to help astrophotographers you know, identify where what the, what objects are are best in the night sky when and when to shoot them. So this covers kind of an homage to Messier. We picked 110 of the finest objects and and did a lot of uh, put a lot of exposure time into each one. You know, has has a write up on each one. So this is kind of a coffee table style book that Max and I have produced. But the most important image in that book is the one we want to talk about today. So. This started, actually, um, Max had the idea of, well, there's a, a lot of great objects all along the Milky Way, right? That's kind of where all the nebulae uh, globular clusters lie. Let's let's take a big mosaic of that. And so we started doing that and it's going along pretty well. And pretty soon we were like, well, why don't we just keep going until we do the whole sky? And, and sure enough, that's exactly what we did. However, I will say that going from a finite uh, sort of mosaic of you know, uh, reasonable proportions to the whole night sky turned out to be uh, introducing a, a lot of technical challenges that we had to overcome. Uh, but the final image uh, you see here, this is uh, RGB with hydrogen alpha overlay to better highlight all the nebulosity in the sky. It's a 153 panel mosaic. And we kind of use it as the framework in the book to show people where things are in the night sky relative to each other. But also it gives you a very interesting relative sense of scale because deep sky images, you really don't have anything to give you perspective as to sort of how closely zoomed in you are, so to speak, right? What's the field of view that you're looking at? And this gives you a much better sense of uh, the relative size of things. I, I always joke with groups like this that the, the different sizes of objects really means that you need different fields of view which is gonna mean you're gonna to have to buy multiple telescopes. So if your significant other is challenging you on why are you buying so many telescopes? I mean, you can say that Charlie and Max said that you needed to buy these additional telescopes in order to image everything that's out there. We're not gonna be there for the fight, so it's okay. Um, let's just take this image and, and zoom in. You, you're already probably looking at it and seeing oh these are i know that object i know that object and so just to give you a sense of the 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 resolution that we've got and, and what these objects look like let's you know the heart of the milky way right so uh sagittarius and uh scorpius ophiuchi those constellations ophiuchus um let's zoom in on that just to give you a sense i this i mean there's more stuff here than than we can probably call out but the the obvious one is the Rho ophiuchi area that, you know, the, the the Pentagon here with Antares and M4 and just so much nebulosity. You get the dark nebula streaming in. Uh, we'll talk about this big thing up here uh, in a little bit, actually. But you can just see all the nebulosity looking right into the center of the Milky Way. Another 
popular area for deep sky imaging, uh, the area of Orion. And if we zoom in on that, this is this is what it looks like in the mosaics. You can clearly see Orion, all the, the popular nebulae in there, M42, the Horsehead Nebula, Barnard's Loop, capturing all of that, uh, as, as well as the Lambda Orionis ring above it. This thing to the left, that's the rosette. Uh, and, and there's several other nebulae around there, the Cone and the Foxfur area. So just to give you a sense of, you know, when you see them all in, in one image, what they look like. Char Charlie. Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can you go back to the big wide shot, the, the, the full Monty, the whole shebang? I, I, I think most people in this audience will um, not, not, not need any explanation for why the Milky Way is in this curved mm. snake-like shape, but may, maybe it would be useful at this point just to explain kind of what we're looking at here. Yeah, fair, fair, fair point, Max. Uh, we, we do sort of scale the uh, the level of this talk uh, for different audiences. But yes, absolutely. As you're aware, the, the Milky Way is in a plane, right? When you look out in the night sky and you are uh, looking at along the plane of our galaxy, of course, and the curve is merely an artifact of the, the projection. So this image is projected in what is called an equirectangular projection. Uh, that allows us to preserve the coordinate system of you know, hours of right ascension and, you know, declination north and south and sort of have it on a grid to, to locate things. But um, it does, of course, introduce some distortion at the top, similar to what you might see with the Mercator projection. And as a result of that distortion, we always liken it to flattening an orange peel, right? When you take something that's three dimensions, flatten it down to two, something has to give and you have to give up either, you know, directional correctness size correctness, you know, things like that. And so that's what's happening here. So the Milky Way, of course, does not form a U-shape in the sky, but that's what you see here. Great, great point, Max, yeah. I always like the fact that you can see, I believe you guys call it the plow, we call it the Big Dipper here, right? To right smack in the middle uh, of the, the image. But another area uh, worth calling out uh, is this one. So here's the California Nebula and the Pleiades and the whole Auriga region, right? And just gives you a sense of uh, the, the scale and location of these guys. Also reminds you that you can take great wide fields uh, and you, you might, you see a lot of those in Astrobin now where people will go from, let's say the California Nebula, NGC 1499, all the way down to the Pleiades in one kind of mosaic and show all the, the dust and everything that's in between there. So uh, you also see when you look at this scale, some things that, don't normally pop out. And frankly, until recently, we're not really imaged all that much. So uh, on the left, this is um, uh, known as Sharpless 27, but it's that that giant, it's a really old emission nebula that you don't see a lot. Uh, it, it used to be, I think it's been referred to as the Zeta Ophiuchus nebula. I've heard it called the Cobalt nebula, but you know, properly, probably Sharpless 27. Absolutely huge. I think it spans like uh, 10 degrees across. The biggest nebula in the sky, GUM-12, the GUM nebula, this spans over 36 degrees. Uh, even with a wide angle lens, we had to use a mosaic to capture it all. It takes up like, you know, half the sky, um, super faint, but kind of covers the whole Vila Supernova rem remnant region, but way, way, way larger. And then my favorite actually on the right, um, this is called the Fishhook Nebula. Uh, so this is Sharpless 2, 245 extremely faint, not often imaged. Um, I don't think a lot's known about the astrophysics of it, but it's sort of lurking over there past the constellation Orion and as big as the constellation o Orion. So at this scale, you start to reveal nebulosity that just you don't normally see otherwise. All right, so Max and I have broken up the rest of the talk into three parts just to talk about how we created this image. So as you can imagine, a lot went into it. That is a gigapixel image, 1.1 billion pixels that uh, are in that, that image, uh, I think 7,000 sub-exposures. So it was fairly complicated. So we're gonna walk through this in three sections. I'm gonna cover planning. Max is gonna talk about acquisition. Well, I'll come back and cover processing. So from a planning perspective, um, the way that we used to do things back in the old days of, you know, eight years ago, uh, or even five years ago for some of us. Um, you, this is, I went back in my notebooks and I actually looked, 
where I had planned a couple of just, you know, two by two, four, four panel mosaics. And yeah, this was kind of the way you did it. You sort of plotted it out a little bit and said, oh, okay, um, I kind of want to be centered here, 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 and here. Let's make sure there's enough overlap. Um, I think there, there was some limited software support for this, but, you know, frankly, if you didn't own that piece of software, um, you had to do it yourself. Now, of course, it's, you know, free open source software like Nina um, in about five seconds can plan out and, sh and overlay it onto a NASA image, uh, a 20 panel mosaic of Cygnus, right? So this was my project for last summer. Uh, I took a 20 panel mosaic of Cygnus over the course of three months. You tell Nina, 15% um, overlap. My camera is oriented, you know, eight degrees and it plans it all out. It creates, it even creates, uh, you know, sessions for you basically to, you know, automatically point the scope. Absolute piece of cake now. However, for what Max and I wanted to do, even Nina uh, isn't going to be able to fully do what we needed to do, which is cover the whole sky from multiple sites. So that did require a little bit of custom software. So I had written a book called the Astrophotography Sky Atlas that had required me to do some reprojections and some, uh, some of the, basically write a lot of functions that covered all the math of pointing things in the sky, so to speak. And so I rejiggered that a little bit to create uh, the plan for this. So this is just an example. This is what Max was talking about earlier, where you know when you when you project something 3D onto a 2D surface, you end up with distortion. And I've just sort of shown it here, where you know a point. You know when you look at it on the sky, a the sensor's field of view is a perfect little rectangle. When you show that on a normal like equirectangular map. That's what it looks like with kind of the distortions on the right, with those distortions being greater as you get toward the poles. But looking at this and trying to figure out where we needed to point the scope and from where, and making sure the sensor orientation, everything was, was giving us full coverage of the sky, but appropriate overlap. Because if you've ever done a mosaic, one of the key things with a mosaic is you don't you, you want you want at least 15% overlap because that's where the gradients. Uh, are going to be analyzed. That's that's where you're going to look at the two, so you can normalize the brightness of the two panels. So we shot we shot for substantial overlap in our panels. This is what the final plan looked like when you overlay all 153 panels on the sky. Um, in retrospect, uh, we we kind of placed the cameras, not necessarily thinking about the um, the mosaic at the time, and so that's why they're you know, the sensors are sort of oriented at, at this 45 degree angle. Uh, but once you've got that angle, you need to keep it, right? So we, once you've sort of planned out everything to make sure that everything overlaps according to plan. <clears throat> the other thing we had to figure out was when to shoot. So I wrote up some code to say, okay, what would be the, the best panel to shoot on a given night or vice versa to say for each panel, when should we shoot it? And it, we had four locations. We ended up not using my location in the US just because it had more light pollution than all the others. But we had sites set up, as Max will show you, in the UK, where he is. We had a remote scope in Chile and a remote scope in Spain. And so this allowed us to say, how much clear, dark time are we going to get for each panel so that we can say, ah, on this night, these are the ideal panels that we should shoot and we could plan out the year. So we, in addition to having the locations planned out on maps, we actually had a planner to work us through uh, what nights were best for each panel and what we should be shooting. So we could steadily work through each one. I think this audience probably is aware of this, but you know, why do we have to have sites around the world for this? Well, we see different parts of the sky from different parts of the planet, obviously, right? So in the Northern Hemisphere, we you know, are looking upward, so to speak. Uh, and in the Southern Hemisphere, we're looking downward on this diagram relative to where the sun is. The other thing is you're not gonna be able to do this in anything less than about a year because as the earth moves in orbit around the sun, right? We are looking at different parts of the sky. So the nighttime sky is the part that's facing away from the sun. And so as we move around different constellations, different parts of the sky, come into view. So that that's why it required the planners to say, okay, from Spain, from Chile, from the UK, on a given night, what's what's in best position? And you really want to be imaging when things are high in the sky, right? That's when you're looking through the least air 
Uh, so there's going to be the, the least turbulence. There's going to be the less light pollution. You want to image as high as possible. So that's kind of how we did it. We said, okay, you know, early in the night, panel 65 is going to be high. As that starts to come down, panel 72 is going to be up high again at this site. And that way we can maximize our, our deep sky time. And that's true, not just for mosaics, obviously for any one imaging. Okay, so we've got it all planned out. We're ready to go. Now we just got to acquire the data. Max, walk them through how we acquired all of this data. Right, well, um, 153 panels may seem like quite a big mosaic, but it was only that few because we actually used a pretty wide angle lens. Um, we, we used a, a 35 millimeter lens, uh, which is obviously a, a slightly wide lens in 35 millimeter camera terms. Um, and um, we uh, used that uh, in combination with a CMOS camera, one of the, what was then new generation of ZWO CMOS cameras. And that's the red object you can see on the, the back of our setup. And uh, that has uh, uh, an image size of roughly 4,000 by 3,000 pixels. So quite a nice resolution, not as, not as big as the latest ones now, but really pretty good. And um, it has two stage cooling, Peltier cooling. So you can, you can cool the sensor down. And just in front of the red camera, uh, you can see uh, the first of the two um, sort of disc-like objects, that's the filter wheel. And we had seven uh, filters there. We, we, we shot, in fact, uh, using just six of them, red, green, blue, and then the three narrowband filters, hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. And um, so far, it's really been the red, green, and blue, and hydrogen that have given us the best signal to noise. Uh, we may yet go back and see what we can get out of the sulfur and oxygen. But um, essentially, as well as having to take 153 pictures of uh, the entire night sky over a year from both hemispheres, we also had to take uh, the six different filters. And uh, as, as uh, all of you listening to this talk who uh, know about astrophotography will be aware, it's not enough just to take a single picture. Uh, you have to take multiple pictures in order to stack them for each of the each of the filters. So, in fact, that's how we get to the seven thousand or so subs that we've used in the image so far. Um, so we had identical systems both in the north and the south. Um, the lens that you can see at the front is a Samyang, uh, a thirty-five millimeter f two lens and we stopped it down to f2.8 just to get the sharpest possible corners um, because it's quite a wide lens and uh, on a large, large-ish sensor, you are beginning to see aberrations, comma, otherwise. And then um, the most difficult challenge was focusing, which I'll come back to in a bit, but actually the camera we're showing in this photograph was one of our earlier prototypes that used um, an uh, amazing focuser called an Atlas, that actually moved the lens backwards and forwards. And unfortunately, we found that was a very bad design. <laughs> that uh, did not work. <laughs> with these modern uh, camera lenses, computer design, you have to rotate, physically rotate the uh, lens grip to, to, to move the internal lens elements to get a really good image. So we moved over, and I think we might see it in a later image. Um, we moved over to a, a kind of a cogwheel system with a stepper motor that could physically turn the lens. And it, it turned out to be surprisingly reliable. Then um, the other slightly innovative thing we, we uh, selected in our, in our system is the very small mount that you can see there. And that's a harmonic drive mount. Uh, this particular one is made by a Korean company called Rainbow Astro. And I think we were one of the first people in the world to uh, deploy it on such an ambitious project. And I have to say it was a real workhorse. It's an amazing piece of engineering. It uses exactly the same technology as, you, as is used in uh, many of the Martian rovers for driving the wheels. It's a very clever uh, system of uh, 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 dr driving uh, uh, with, with, with great force and precision. Um, and uh, it, it, it can be controlled using an ASCOM driver um, it's very, very powerful. The small mount like that could actually take a telescope three or four times as big as the one you're seeing. And we found it to be really a great 
workhorse in, uh, in, in our project. Um, so we had three sites. Um, one of them was in my observatory on Holy Island in Northumberland. That's my back garden. And you can just about see Holy Island Castle lit by the sun in the background there. Um, but the, the uh, key one, of course, was having an observatory that we could use in the Southern Hemisphere. And we were very, very fortunate there to be one of the first uh, hosting customers at Deep Sky Chile, uh, which is uh, highly recommended, um, run by the Frenchman you can see there, Frank Jobard. And at the time I was there, just before the pandemic, um, there were just two buildings. I think it, they're now five. It's, it's grown enormously. And it's located in an extremely remote part of Chile, uh, not in the Atacama Desert, where I think many people assume that's where the best uh, astronomical observatories are located, but actually in, in, in the kind of middle of the uh, dry Andean area north of Santiago. And, and the closest big town is La Serena on the coast. And inland, uh, the nearest town about 50 kilometers away is Ovale. And it, it's an incredible location. Um, it's got three um, really great features. One is that um, the weather is just superb. Um, uh, at least before El Nino uh, came to the fore this year, we were getting over 300 clear nights a year. Uh, and you can compare that to Edinburgh or uh, Holy Island in Northumberland, where you're extremely lucky to get three nights a month. And uh, of course, for half the year, you don't get astronomical darkness or, or maybe a third of the year. So uh, very, very clear skies. Um, the seeing is superb. Um, the um, uh, laminar airflow from the Pacific hasn't yet hit the Andes and got broken up into turbulence. So you get a very clear stream of air going uh, right overhead. And, uh, and then of course, it's a very dry um, environment, uh, very, very dark skies, um, Bortle one. And in fact, it's in the middle of absolutely nowhere. You have to drive to get there in this truck. And if you, um, if you if you're not careful, uh, you can you can easily drive over these six inch cactus spikes, which the cactus casts off as a kind of protection for its seeds. And one of those will go through the tire of your four wheel drive with no trouble at all. Now, in the day, as you're driving up full of enthusiasm after a decent night's sleep, you can just drive slowly and carefully and avoid these things. But at four in the morning, after you've failed to polar align your telescope for the sixth time when you're absolutely exhausted and it's dark, um, it's a real hazard. And uh, it made the trips, the 20 kilometer drive from the nearest village up to the observatory um, uh, a real challenge. If you just go back, Charlie, to the previous slide, uh, I'll point out one thing that's quite interesting. And uh, you can actually see um, the observatory just about. It's a kind of a teeny white dot uh, just in front of the car. If you move, move your cursor just to the right a bit, Charlie, move it, move it a little way to the right. Bit more, bit more, bit more, bit more. There's a teeny white dot just there to the right of the cursor. That's the observatory. And there is only one other neighboring building that you can see. And that's on one of the mountain peaks just above the car. And on that distant mountain peak, about 30 kilometers away, which incredibly you can see because the seeing is, is so good, the sky is so clear, there is a building which is now known as the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And um, I'm sure many of you know that this is going to transform astronomy next year when it sees first light. It's the most incredible telescope that is going to produce a tsunami of data. Um, it's basically going to be taking a very wide field image, about 3.5 degrees of the sky every 20 seconds. Uh, it'll do a 15 second exposure and then a four second slew. And in, in the course of three uh, years, excuse me, in the course of three days, it will image the entire southern night sky with 18,000 images and do a mosaic like, like the one we're talking about, only 
with, with phenomenal resolution. We're being replaced, uh, Max. <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, in the course of its 10-year mission, it's going to revisit each patch of sky 800 times, and it will process the, this, this, this torrent of data. Um, I, think it, I think it has a storage capacity for the system of about 100 petabytes, and it will process this torrent of data. And within 60 seconds, it will send out alerts to astronomers around the world who've subscribed for anything that's changed in that image, comparing it to the previous time uh, or previous times that, that that bit of sky was imaged. And um, I listened to a talk recently about it, and it's uh, it, it's going to be the most transformative uh, development for many areas of astronomy. It should answer within a few weeks whether there's a ninth planet. It will discover tens of thousands of new asteroids so that we'll basically know the location and position of every asteroid in the solar system larger than a car. And uh, it will see, it, it, they estimate, it will see a million supernovae a year. Um, so, I mean, watch this space. It's going to be the most incredible thing. So, telescope in Chile, um, uh, cactuses, uh, which you need to avoid. There is the all-sky camera um, uh, in the middle, uh, looking up from beneath our system at the amazing heart of the Milky Way. And uh, it's, it's just such a privilege to be able to control that telescope every night and uh, gather this data for our mosaic. On the left, you can see the different focusing system that I mentioned earlier. Um, uh, that there, you can probably see the white uh, toothed gear, um, which is how we're doing the focusing. And above it is the stepper motor. Um, and um, uh, th that, that, that basically was the design that we ended up. Um, I don't know if any of you are hearing a kind of slurping noise. Um, and I've just realized it's me. And I, for the last five or six days, I've been fascinated by a water hole in Namibia, which I've been live streaming. And I think there's some zebra that have just come in <laughs> to um, drink. So uh, I do apologize. I must, uh, I must turn that off. <laughs> there it is. Uh, I'll stop it. Uh, actually, it's a hyena. Uh, right, back to, back to the talk. Uh, apologies. Um, um, so uh, observatory in Chile, deep sky Chile, uh, which is where we imaged all the southern uh, targets, particularly the wonderful Magellanic clouds, which is such a highlight in the south. And then um, in, in, uh, in the northern hemisphere, we set up, like you've done, um, an observatory, a, a system at an observatory EI um, uh, in Spain, near Seville, up in the hills. And again, there's a remote facility there where we could install an identical system. And um, that, that, there again, highly recommended. Um, we had about 270 clear nights, I think, there. And so we were able to complete our project in about uh, a year and a half. Um, and generally, we got between 12 and 16 images for each panel in each of the filters that we needed. I think that's right, Charlie. Yeah, and, at f2.8, which, which helps, yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So the biggest challenge is remote focus. And um, you can see here, one of the difficulties is that the stars, of course, are at infinity. And the infinity position on the lens is that little L mark. Um, and um, the great difficulty with automating remote focus using a camera lens is that in order to achieve focus, you have to go past and through focus in both directions. Now, there's no trouble um, focusing closer than infinity and, and producing the left side of this focus curve. But the difficulty with a standard lens is that you can't go more than a teeny fraction of a degree past infinity. And so we had to build a custom uh, mount for our lens that actually um, positioned the lens a bit closer than it normally would be to the sensor. And that is actually rather difficult because there's not much space in the optical train to do that. So um, uh, I'm fortunate to have a brilliant mechanical engineer near me in Holy Island, and he uh, manufactured a, a mount um, that, that uh, was a kind of a shrunken version of uh, the normal mount and took off about three millimeters 
from the normal position. And that allowed us to, in fact, achieve sharp focus at the 10 uh, meter mark on the lens. And then as we moved the lens backwards and forwards uh, with that, that uh, 10 meter infinity uh, position um, at the bottom of the curve, in, in Nina, the software that Charlie mentioned, you can take a quick series of five second exposures using the luminance filter or whichever filter you're exposing with and measure the size of the stars. And basically the better focus you've got, the smaller the stars will be. And so in this chart, you can see on the left, this plot, you're looking uh, for the lowest point on that curve and that's your best focus position. And um, here you can see it's at about 4,075 or thereabouts. And this whole process is totally automated. Uh, you set it up and then every time you change filter, Nina will refocus. And uh, as those of you who've done this will know, the great challenge is when the uh, temperature falls during the night, it can fall by several degrees between dusk and dawn. And this causes the metal of your camera and lens to get cooler, to contract. And that's enough to throw your focus out by maybe 100 or 200 uh, positions on this chart. So basically every 30 minutes or so, or whenever you change a filter, it's necessary to repeat this focusing process and then you're good to go for maybe uh, the next half hour or an hour. And also um, each filter, the teeny difference in thickness of the glass of each of the filters in the filter wheel, that's also enough to throw the focus out. Um, and in surprisingly unpredictable ways. So uh, achieving focus, I would say, was the technically most challenging part of the project. Apart from processing. <laughs> um, so here's a typical uh, view uh, from the driver's seat uh, during the night. It would all run automatically. Uh, I'd take the panels that we need needed to photograph at that particular, on that particular day from that location, set it all up in Nina. Um, and in principle, I could go to bed at the normal time, wake up in the morning, check everything was finishing off in, in Chile and all the data would then automatically upload to Dropbox. Uh, it, I have to say it was just a lovely smooth system and uh, uh, I, I kind of break out in a sweat when I think about doing it now, but uh, we did actually manage to do it in the year and a half. It's funny. I break out in a cold sweat thinking about processing the data, Max. Uh, so it's uh, this is something Max and I have thrown around the idea of doing again, and we're like, mm, maybe let's hold off. But uh, I, I did see in the chat, by the way, somebody was asking about the moon. Yes, absolutely. So we did account for the moon in that planner. So uh, we shot RGB data when the moon was uh, less than a quarter, and we shot narrowband mostly hydrogen and sulfur when the moon was greater than that we basically never shot right around a full moon um and we sort of kept the oxygen uh filter which is more susceptible um uh, closer to the the new moon as well um so for processing the data so max said it took 18 months to gather the data uh processing took something like six months um i don't remember exactly but somewhere six or seven months something like that i did just want to show um uh, max and i have not re-image the whole night sky, but we did recently uh, collaborate on a couple other mosaics, this one being the most recent one. So 844 megapixel, 27 panel mosaic of the Large Magellanic Cloud. This one is amazing. You can zoom in, like it feels like almost forever. <laughs> um, so this is a 225 hours of, of exposure time image. We collaborated with the uh, our friends who are collaborating with in the put in this scope in Chile. So this was obviously taken from Chile. So uh, with Charles Pevsner and uh, and Raymond Protier. That was a beast of process, but only uh, a sm this is small in comparison to what it took to process the, the bigger mosaics. So mosaics inherently come with several problems. So from a processing perspective, first of all, you're dealing with much, much larger images, right? So you you're gonna have to beef up your computer, but really what it is is every step is gonna take a lot longer. And if you if process images, you know, there's a lot of iteration where you're like, oh, don't quite like the way that turned out. Oh, that didn't process right. Let me go back a step and redo it. Everything just becomes a lot bigger. The number two is the biggest problem 
for mosaics in general are gradients. You really have to make sure that gradients are fully removed. So light pollution is your enemy. The moon is your enemy. Flat fielding needs to be excellent because when you're taking two panels and putting them you know, on top of each other and you're looking at that overlapping region, the gradients will become immediately obvious. That's what reveals those seams when you look at a poorly done mosaic. So just showing some examples there when things didn't go quite as we planned. And then for this mosaic in particular, the fact that the sky does not have a boundary actually introduced a bunch of other tricky issues. So when uh, a lot of the processes we were using required knowledge of where the image was being taken in the sky, what part of the sky, and as you get close to the poles, for instance, you, if you take an image that spans over the top of the pole, you've got discontinuities in like right ascension, for instance. So the right ascension will go from six hours to eight hours asymptotically, right? There's just a discontinuous jump between those two. So the software does not handle these things very well in PixInsight. So there were a lot of workarounds, a little bit of custom code we had to do. So this, this mosaic in particular had an additional problem. Um, we really, you know, it's kind of as you'd imagine, the first thing you have to do is you have to get each image, integrate it, uh, and process it. So as Max mentioned, RGB, hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, you had to integrate each of those and do a really good job of flat fielding, everything like that. And so that you have the raw data. Then we took the raw data, we reprojected re each of the individual images into the, the projection we were going to use at the end, which is that equirectangular. Then we, I took each of the, each of them and sort of grouped them into these groups of five to 10 panels, sort of built a mini mosaic of little areas of the sky. You can't just do it all at once. There's going to be too many gradient issues. Frankly, from a processing perspective, throwing a billion pixels into your computer is just going to be too much. So really breaking it down into little bits and pieces to work on. I called these super panels. Then I took the super panels and I, I created a uh, PixInsight has a tool that allows you to take the, the star catalogs and create a, an artificial image. So you can take the star, star catalogs and create a fake image of where all the stars, and then I can use that to match the super panels onto that image, register them onto it, like a foundation for, for sticking this puzzle pieces together. Then finally, you got to bring all those together, manage the gradients, adjust colors, things like that. Again, we're doing this for red, green, blue, hydrogen, sulfur, oxygen, 153 panels. Some of them, I will say, just great images on your own. Max, I know you always like this one. This is pretty obviously a hydrogen alpha image of, of Orion. And this is this was just what came straight out, like with, with no real processing, right? And this just goes to show the benefits. Max mentioned that we, you know, we're basically getting one to two hours of exposure time for each panel. We're doing that at F2.8. So that's a fair amount of light intensity on the sensor. So you can go fairly deep with that. So this is what I'd mentioned. This is sort of the process that I just went through, right? So I will can't emphasize enough after you integrate, making sure that gradients are properly controlled was important. Plate solving each image, that actually turned out to be fairly difficult. Um, rescaling and reprojecting so that then we had them all in the same projection and could put them together. And that reprojection um, was kind of interesting, just, uh, just to show a couple examples of it. Uh, you know, Mosaic by Coordinates is the tool in PixInsight that allows you to do this. It's, it's pretty amazing, actually. Um, but to give you a sense, this is a rectangular field of view, like a normal sensor. But this is what happens when you reproject it as you start getting close to the poles, right? We talked about that, the, that distortion effect earlier. But the ultimate flat image we wanted, we, you know, we chose in this projection. And this is what it looked like. This is a super panel, right? So this is actually four or five panels. I think this is four that I put together. And this is actually at the pole. And here's where you see the sort of the extremes of um, the distortion at the very top where stars get sort of stretched out into little lines. And one of the interesting things there is you cannot uh, do a star alignment because PixInsight and any other software doesn't recognize a line as a star. So there were some other things we had to do to you know, help facilitate the, the alignment of these onto our sort of framework image. These are just my personal notes as I'm going through it, but 
I'd love to say that there was some really super smart plan of, oh, we're going to do these super panels, but it was really mostly just working through them, picking by hand, going, oh, these, these eight panels, these look like these are a cluster. I can put these together. And this is, as I circled them, I was circling them as I checked off that I had processed and integrated them into a super panel. Um, so this is the behind the scenes process that you'd love to think was really automated and smooth looking, and it looks nothing like that at all in the day-to-day -day grind of, of getting all the data. This was the first super panel that I created, and that NASA had created an image where they took, I think it was the Gaia data, I, I'm pretty sure that was what it was, um, and they plotted the entire night sky. And it looks like an image of the night sky, but it's it's not. It's just a plot of all the stars plotted by their, their, their color temperature, kind of in an appropriate color. But it made a great test for us. So I literally took the first super panel that we created, and I opened up that image that NASA had created, or that, that sort of map, I guess, that NASA had created in Photoshop, and I just tried to overlay ours. And yes, like it worked like to the star, like they just aligned perfectly. And I was like, yes, okay. So no major errors have been committed, at least in like the, the distortion of, of anything. The stars are where they're supposed to be, right? So great, we're off to a great start. So I did this for all the super panels, right? So we pulled together each of the super panels, 28 of them, and they need to again be done for red, green, blue, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur. I mentioned this, there's a couple other things that had to be done here. The panels have to be normalized in brightness to each other, which required a little bit of custom code in PixInsight. Uh, then they need to be trimmed so that they actually don't make that mistake of going over either the top of the pole, or I couldn't also do them spanning the zero 24 hour line, like the prime meridian of right ascension. So we had to sort of make sure that all the images were trimmed just right so that they didn't trigger any of these, these math errors that were going to happen when the when it tried to, to align things. This is the first, after overcoming all these obstacles, yes, we've got it all. And I was actually pretty happy with this. So I was like, this is the first, the first output image overlay. But this really highlights, for those of you who've done mosaics, you know this, gradients are tough to resolve, right? So like this shows, wow, we still have some, there's some maybe some flat fielding errors and some normal things, panels aren't normalized correctly to each other, the color balance is off. Okay, but we've got an image. And I did just highlight in this, I put the arrows there, something I didn't even think about until after the we'd taken the data. Um, you can see Mars, I believe this is uh, Mars and, and Jupiter here. And it's cool that they're in the image and that's not a problem. The challenge was sometimes because of the moon, we would take red, green, blue of one area one night, and then it'd be a month later, we would take hydrogen, alpha, oxygen, sulfur, and you'd have the planets in different positions in the image. So we actually had to remove most of the planets. We did we did leave one one or two of them in um, where they hadn't moved that much. But I actually had to go in and sort of you know cut those out. Yes, Max. Yep. Yeah. Very quick two points, Charlie. One, yeah. it's also interesting to note. Maybe you were about to mention it, but bottom left, we did miss one very small triangle of sky. Not sure uh, how so that happened. <laughs> that black triangles. So I think I had an emergency reshoot to to fill that in. Um, but the other yep. the other thing is Charlie's mentioned Pix Insight, which I'm sure most most of you know, a very powerful um, image processing uh, package which we really relied on. But we should also give uh, considerable credit to Astro Pixel Processor, which yep. we used for the more basic steps of um, integration and. Uh, um, you know, filtering quality and, and that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah, AstroPixel processor is fantastic for that. Yep. So here is the RGB image. And we were very, very excited about this. Uh, this was looking great. We honestly, I think the prettier image, and I know Max, you like this one a lot. This is the alpha, H alpha image of the whole night sky. And I think just the the contrast here and the unique uniqueness of seeing all the nebulosity in one place is just a really cool, cool picture. Then you combine them, uh, you get the final image, right? So this is our H alpha RGB image of the whole night sky. And then one thing we found that really helps orient people is it's a lot to take in in one image. Um, it's just to overlay the 
the constellation lines, as well as a couple of the major big objects in here, just to sort of orient everybody. But this is the final product. So we were able to take this image. In addition to all the images we taken in the visible unit for the visible universe, um, we were able to use this kind of as the table of contents almost for that book and reproject some parts of, uh, of this image. So for instance, we took the, that H alpha image that you saw and we divided this night sky up into eight uh, sectors and reprojected those into something more like what you would see. So I think this is like an orthographic projection just to really show like, I think this is a great one where you see the heart of the Milky Way or the Northern Milky Way with Cygnus in it, Cepheus, all of that just to show. And the, the numbers here are the 110 objects or at least the ones that appeared in this part of the night sky uh, that are featured in the book. And we use this. So we were able to get a lot of use out of this one image that Max and I had taken, sort of wove it throughout the book as a bit of a guide. So um, we do offer the books. I just wanted to call out um, just recently so that we have the book, but also that night sky image. Uh, actually, I took, I had posters printed up of it. Uh, so we've got those as well. So um, we'll just pause here for uh, any questions. Sorry, I think we ran over a couple of minutes, but um, would be happy to chat with you guys. And I saw um, a couple questions coming in in the chat already, I believe. Uh, let me just quickly interject and say that um, if anyone is interested in getting a copy of the book, um, since you're UK based, it's probably best if you email me and my email is there on the uh, on the screen, max at natureguides.com. Um, the book is the books, not the normal price of the book is 55 uh, pounds on Amazon. Um, uh, but we will we, we'll, uh, we'll ship you individual copies uh, at the lower price here if uh, anyone's interested. Thank you very much. Do we have any more questions? I can see one in the um, chat, Charlie, which uh, ah. I'm going to let you, you take, I think. Yes, okay. So wouldn't it have been better to, to have done your super panels on a spherical projection and only turned to a plane late in the process? Um, there probably are a lot of different ways to do this, but the challenge was, um, well... The super panels probably could have been done that way and then reprojected. There could have been an issue that I was afraid of, which would be that the processing power required, because each of those super panels was, you, you know, um, the image that you saw was a billion pixels. Actually, each of the super panels was something like half a billion pixels. And there's some downsampling in that final image that that was necessary. So there was to re to reproject those accurately. Number one, an image that big, I was concerned processing wise was just going to take too long. Each of these actually reprojections was an overnight run on my computer, which was a Ryzen seven processor with 64 gigabytes of RAM, which in 2020 when we were doing this was a lot. So it, those were overnight reprojections. The other thing was the accuracy of the projections, as you try to reproject a larger piece of it at a time, um, I fear would introduce more errors. And the, it would be quite obvious in the final projection if even the stars were off a tiny bit because you would get sort of double stars or, or wide stars or something like that. So it was a, a choice to do the reprojection part with the smallest piece to maximize accuracy, basically. And I see somebody earlier in the chat um, asked about getting the image for their desktop. We, we, we published it in the book and we're working on an app version of it. Um, so that will be coming next year. Uh, so uh, that, that's gonna be the best way to get it in digital form. Um, I'm very conscious in this presentation that you're looking at it you know, via Zoom, highly compressed, um, it is an amazing image to actually have on, you know, in Photoshop or something on your machine and zoom into because um, Charlie showed one of the individual panels. But of course, you can do that and zoom smoothly in and out. So it, it, it is a lovely thing. And I found it incredibly useful uh, getting my head around where things are in the sky. And, and really, you know, that, that's the way we use it in the book. Um, so for each of the numbers in the book, the 110 objects, we then have a double page spread. I don't know whether you've got that visible anywhere, Charlie, but um, uh, ba basically the main meat of the book 
Um, it's a 250 page book is a double page spread on most of the um, target objects. And um, there's the poster with uh, Charlie's telescope. Yeah, so there's a good example. Um, so uh, we actually managed to win an APOD for one of our images taken from Holy Island, I have to say. The only APOD I'm sure from Holy Island, Max. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but shows that the night skies are quite dark, especially for a dark nebula like this. But there you see you know, a big image on the left, um, the chart. Uh, maybe you'd like to explain uh, the, the, the chart, Charlie. Yeah, so we, uh, so I, part of the software that I wrote also allowed us to calculate the, what I like to call quality imaging hours for an object, which is from a given latitude and a given time of year, how many hours can you expect this object to be above, let's say, 25 degrees altitude, right? You, you don't want to image down close to the horizon. So when when is it going to be best positioned throughout the year? And so we we created these charts in here just to show the most common latitudes where the population of the world lies, you know, 30, 40, 50 north, and then sort of 30 south um, to give you a sense of when the best time to image each object might be. So you can see here that the, for Wolf's Cave, for instance, if you guys are about 50 degrees north, that's the blue line. You can expect this doesn't account for the moon, but you can expect about thir almost 13 hours uh, right around New Year's of, of good imaging time in this object for a night. And the text that's there, uh, there's a, you know, a decent amount of text for each object. A little bit of it is the kind of astrophysics um, and uh, you know, general description of the object. But most of it is Charlie's really useful advice on how to image it, you know, if, which filters to use. What processing techniques and so on, and that that's fairly unique information. And I I found it extraordinarily useful as I've been um, trying to develop my astrophotography. Very good. Any more questions? Yes, or... please. Yes, I was. Uh, I think at the start of the talk, gentlemen. Thanks very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Uh, you, you right at the start, you mentioned uh, you were going to say something about. Uh, how you two managed to team up as collaborators, because it, stru it struck me watching uh, the huge amount of effort and work that had been put into this whole project, not to mention time and money, um, that it was the kind of project that you would either end up as uh, the best of best friends or the worst <laughs> of enemies uh, at the end of uh, something like that. So so what, what's the story of, of, of Whitby and Bracken? Well, I, I'm delighted to say it was the former of those. and. Uh, I don't think Charlie, I can remember a single cross word anywhere in the no. period. Three, you know, five thousand miles between us probably helps, but you know, it's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I mentioned uh, at one point that I, I bought Charlie's book, The Deep Sky Primer, um, yes. which is a marvelous uh, way to get up the learning curve. And um, I then went to um, the great astronomy jamboree uh, in uh, in New York called NEF. It, it's a conference that. Uh, usually happens every year, apart from pandemics. And um, Charlie happened to be going too, and I got in touch with him, and we decided to meet up. And uh, we went and had lunch in an all-you-can-eat Mexican sushi um, restaurant. Um, and um, it was a very good lunch. And uh, at the end of it, we decided to collaborate. And I, I, uh, I think I suckered him in because I produced a few quite successful apps uh, in my previous career, and I said that the what I wanted to do was to do an astronomy app, an astrophotography app, and so he he, he agreed. But then, uh, after a few months, it metamorphosed into a book first. But we are still working on the app, and I think it will be a very exciting app. And um, and actually, um, some of you may be aware uh, of the Apple uh, Vision Pro device which has been announced you know this very very high resolution um ar headset that doesn't that you you wear but it keeps you in the environment you're in and i i think that our data in that is going to be awesome um and so i think hopefully it will our collaboration will will lead to a digital project and what what, what are the time skills for that max um well the that, that particular device so uh, I suspect will actually be become available next year in quite an expensive uh, version, and then it will become cheaper 
um, in the following year as, as Apple releases a less expensive one, a bit like you know any of their new technology. But I hope we can get an app out uh, next year in 2024, which will run on iPads and phones and desktop computers. And that will essentially have this data in a, in a way which is a, uh, I mean, if you can imagine putting on a headset and, and essentially putting yourself into our all sky image, um, it's an amazing, we've, we, we've got a pretty advanced prototype and it, it's an amazing thing. It's essentially like floating in space well away from the earth and the sun and being able to look in any direction. And then we have the 110 high resolution objects that you can zoom into. So uh, it's a great it's a great experience, and we're limited really just by you know sheer hours in the day because it's quite a complicated software development, um, but uh, one we're incredibly excited by. Thank you very much. Audio class is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think Apple has mentioned a figure of about three thousand pounds for the um, first device. Um, which if you consider what it does and the fact that it replaces your very powerful computer on your desk with six monitors um, maybe isn't quite as poor value as it would sound. But re really, I think this technology is on a very sh sharp um, price dropping curve. And, uh, you know, I think within two or three years, uh, there will be systems which are very powerful, a bit like this un under a thousand. Um, and eventually, I think you know they'll. they'll be at at that time. price, you can't afford not to buy it, Max. That's. Uh... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll wait for a while and I'll shoot this stuff behind me. <laughs> yeah, in in Kenya, so it's cheaper uh, that way. It's yeah. it's it's the same price as a trip to Kenya. I mean, you know, but you just don't oh, get Kenya out of it. <laughs> Kenya is a lot cheaper. <laughs> Great talk. Thank you very much, guys. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for thank you for having us. It's great to be here. Like I said, you guys are uh, are true true optimists. It's uh, great to talk to. You. Well, thank, thank, thank you very much. I think everybody, if we could all just show our appreciation for uh, Max and Cheryl. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>